Welcome, my friends. This is Maniacal Incorporated. You join me in what must surely be the final few years of, arguably, the greatest High King of all time, Ruokon II. We're just a few months short of his 66th birthday, which will put him equal to Flansina I as the oldest reigning High King. And had we ever been in a position to do so, he has alliances which would have allowed him to field 21,000 troops, a number that we never came anywhere close to putting on the field. But undoubtedly, from a military point of view and from the point of view of the actual extent of Ireland, and you can just barely see it, hidden behind the rose down here is another part, uh, he is undoubtedly the greatest Irish High King ever to rule. On the last episode, I was trying to figure out what we were going to do with him in this one. I said more than likely we would turn our attention south towards England and an invasion of the kingdom. The problem is that such an invasion costs 1,600 prestige, which we do not have. And attacking while we are under that figure will give us, I think it's uh, 3,200 of a fame penalty. So, of course, we could go and we could raid down areas for that prestige. A, that would take time. And B, we can't because we're in a war, which, yes, it's at 49% at the moment. But either waiting for that war to end or deploying our troops to that war, it's all taking time. It's all taking time that I don't think Ruokon has. More than likely, I was weighing up whether or not while uh, Sweden is weak, whether to um, attack for the remaining two counties in Lothian. I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking of either... A conquest for the two counties that will allow us to usurp this duchy or actually declaring war and taking uh, the duchy that would have previously contained Astrid and Asta Acra. I don't think he's going to be able to pull off a full invasion of the Kingdom of England. And I'm also worried about what will happen on his death because, of course, we have the elective. High King of Ireland. And then we have the hereditary Kingdom of Alba. At the moment, the two of them are going to the same person. Uh, I'm not too sure, is it that because one of them is elective, the primary title is elective, that the secondary title travels with it? Or will we see for the first time ever, um, because this is the first time since the, the title was actually created, will we see the title split off? And if it does, we don't want to be in a position where we've conquered all of Scotland for a new king. I think it would be better if we are going to lose Scotland on Ruokon's death. It would be better that we take chunks of, of England now. These are the concerns that we have to think about in the final days of hiking Ruokon. And another thing we need to think about is the succession itself. Here is our current successor, who we are supporting for the High Kingship, Lachnan II, Lachnan the Foolish. He's 39 years of age, not that old. He's younger than Ruokon was when he ascended to the High Kingship. But he stopped supporting himself, just like Kukarkamur did when he hit a certain age, and he is instead, uh, Lachnan himself, is supporting his son. Again, it's not a very common name, it's not one that I've heard before. The last mention of it in the annals seems to be around the mid to late 800s. I've seen a couple of different pronunciations. I'm going with Ail Gal. Ail Gal Mach Lachnon. A three-star military figure, skill tactician. Uh, he has two virtues of insular Christianity. He's generous and forgiving and fickle. Nothing wrong with being fickle. And he's a holy warrior, which would be handy, which would have been handy against the, the Swedes. So 
I think what we're also going to do is we're actually going to throw our support behind this guy. If Ruokon was to die shortly, it would give us, hopefully, a very long rule. Uh, he's quite young. And again, it would be a high military figure back on the throne to see out, possibly, the uh, the conquest of this entire region, because we also have that bit of, of Brittany to deal with. Uh, possibly returning to our, our failed escapades into Iceland, so... Uh, we're running out of time with Ruokon. Uh, a young character like this, a young military character, might be just what the kingdom needs. There we go, we have a new successor. Our other major problem, and something that he's going to have to take care of, is the fact that if we want to form an empire, so we want to, we want to basically convert all this region, and maybe a, a bit more of stuff, into an empire, we need a thousand gold. Now, we're making a hell of a lot of money per month at the moment. But uh, nowhere near enough that, that Ruokon will ever see... I think it's actually 1,200 gold is what we need. It is, it is. We need another 800 and something. So, our little our little overseas holding is going to be fantastic for that. But again, at the moment, it's it's nothing that we can, we can really do for right now. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait out until Ruokon's birthday... And once we hit that, we're going to turn our attention on England. Just a few days short of our birthday, major preparations are being made, and what a pop-up to get. Our wife tells us that somebody is trying to kill her. She is, of course, our spy master. I think I actually put her finding secrets somewhere, so I'm obviously going to uh, switch that now to disrupt schemes. We must stop the villain behind this. Our primary wife has come to us to tell us that she could improve the performance of some of our chancellors. Um, I think we're just going to go with Ernach. He will gain uh, studying diplomacy. Plus two diplomacy, plus one learning. No penalty to opinion, whereas if we... Uh, send her to good brand, our marshal. We'll get a minus 15. Karnuk, he's fine. He's grand. He's not too much. So, yeah, we'll just uh, send her to Ernach. And for the day that's in it, let's take a look at the world. The 15th of July, 1022. High King Ruokon's 66th birthday. A lot of stuff has happened since the last time that we've actually taken a, a major look at the world. Greater Poland is gone. And I think just Poland, Poland got a bit bigger, but it contracted as well. Bohemia actually split off from it, if I am correct. Uh, the Romagna, I have no idea where they kind of appeared out of. Remember all those wars that we had down there for the Italian crown? Yeah, well... Look how they panned out. Sweden has expanded substantially into north... What would that be? Kind of northern and northeastern Spain. Um, the Gardariki are gone. Their title was actually destroyed in the 970s, if I'm correct. And we can see their allies, Ghana, have lost... I think they used to have... Coastal territories, but they have... Yeah, they did. They actually had um, substantial holdings, so they've been pushed into the center of... What would that be? Northeastern Africa. Of course, the, the Byzantine Empire, they've conquered Rome. I don't really know what's going on in the uh, in the Far East. If we take a look at the religions... Coptic is pretty much wiping out or replacing Orthodox. Uh, there's a Waldensianism, which has taken over in Nitra. Catholicism is in a in a kind of a bad way. They're just holding on to two holy sites of Catholicism at the moment. Um, Cologne, I think, is one of them, and 
uh, Canterbury, which possibly, possibly, we might take control of soon enough. So you could see Catholicism pushed to uh, basically Iceland. Insular Christianity isn't doing great on the continent. We had high hopes for it for a while. I think it was that Swedish invasion of Savoy that really pushed things back for us. It seems to have nearly vanished in northern Italy. And it's also gone from Bavaria. So it was pushing into Bavaria for a, for a period of time. So I think, I think our dreams of an insular Europe are probably at an end. Unless we could use the, uh, the place that we've just conquered. That place right there. Uh, if we could use that as a, a springboard to, uh, to push insular Christianity into Lothringa. Because it does look like there's a couple of places in there already. And actually, I didn't I didn't notice this. We have a we have a, a massive Coptic uh, presence here, which I did notice. I didn't notice the uh, the big Coptic presence down here. Uh, maybe maybe this is where it's meant to be. Again, outside of this region, my knowledge of world history is very limited. Well, there you go. That's what the world looks like in the year ten twenty two. Uh, what would be happening historically at this point in time? So you're looking at the Battle of Clontarf. Last episode, I said it was the 21st of April. It's not. It's the 23rd of April. That was the date that the 1916 Rising was supposed to begin on. So I was like, that can't be. That can't be it. It has to be a different date. But no, apparently it was. It was the 23rd of April. 1014 is uh, is the Battle of Clontarf. Um, 1022, you're basically still recovering. Just like we are still recovering from our wars against the Swedish. Ireland would still have been recovering from the wars against the uh, the Vikings in Dublin. A lot of people were killed in the Battle of Clontarf, so it threw Ireland into a great deal of, not chaos, but just instability for a period of time. Uh, Maul Shocknail MacDonald was returned to the High Kingship, or at least he claimed he was returned to the High Kingship. He died in 1024, so there was this kind of interregnum uh, between the Battle of Clontarf, and especially his death. So, just as Ireland was kind of pulling itself out of uh, out of its restful phase, around the early 10 hundreds, I think we'd better start doing the same. Or around the early 10 twenties, we had better start doing the same. We can't have a feast, sadly, for Ruokon's birthday. But maybe... We'll, uh, we'll see if anybody down in this region wants to give him some birthday cards. Do you know what? One of the first things we'll do on our birthday is a general amnesty. So some people are going to... They're going to learn the good word and the proper methods for the calculation of Easter. You can see how important Easter was to the Irish. Uh, Good Friday, 23rd of April, 1014, Battle of Clontarf. Um, Easter Sunday, 23rd of April, 1916, was meant to be the start of the 1916 Rising. It had to be pushed back a day. And that's just its kind of modern connotations. So Easter has been a, a tremendously important date for the Irish for millennia at this stage. Now, of course, by the 1020s, the uh, the calculation of the date of Easter in insular Christianity had conformed fully to what Rome was doing, but um, shh, let's let's pretend otherwise. So we have a general amnesty on the High King's birthday. We're gaining three hundred troops a month in reinforcements. That's absolutely insane. When we started this video two months ago, as in when this video started just two months back. Uh, since then, I think we've gotten about two, two and a half thousand troops. It's a much greater region than I thought it was. Uh, we could just go for these two counties to to finish off this um, duchy here. But what I think we're going to do instead is we're going to come to the King of England. We're going to declare war. Invade Kingdom. Cost is 1,600, which we don't have. And it would give us a fame penalty of 3,200. So we are going to come for the duchy, and we will change the objective to York, and like I said, it's a bit bigger than I actually expected. I didn't I didn't think it, it reached down into uh, this part. Handy thing is, it gives us 
big borders with some areas that we could push into, unless they accept vassalization. And on Rulecon's birthday, he returns to war. Possibly not needed, but I've called in a few allies. I've actually just called in two. We've called in West Francia, so that in the event of the High King dying during this battle, West Francia will be committed to it, uh, even if we have a transition of power and maybe uh, lose some troop numbers or something like that. The other person I called in, rather interestingly, is the Earl of Huntingdonshire. Slap bang in the middle of the whole thing. So he's now uh, fighting on our side. Possibly English forces coming up from the south might siege this place and leave us alone. I'm bringing our armies in from the north at the moment. Uh, two armies split them off. One is heading for here. Uh, another is heading down into the uh, into West Riding. Should I possibly... I might actually switch him across to... Um... So one of them is, is commanded by our marshal that's coming to here. The other one then is commanded by the peasant leader that we captured in the last battle. I might let them siege down this place first of all and then, um, then bring them across and we'll actually take... The war goal, actually taking the war goal, might make sense. Our spy master, our wife, has discovered that Dunaduch, we knew this, uh, the former high chieftain, I think we considered him for the high kingship at one stage, uh, he died under mysterious circumstances and she has found one of the individuals involved, not only cruel and heartless but dishonorable as well. He's uh, not a member of our house or anything. This, of course, reminds me that I need to change her to disrupt schemes. Very early on in our war, the King of England has died and has been replaced by somebody else. Uh, we've also managed to sway our uh, one of our vassals, um, one of Moltoli's sons, actually. But um, So this is the new King of England. And we can see he's actually lost some capacity. He's lost some troops. Uh, which is... That's kind of helpful for us. We also got a pop-up that one of our regions was under siege. So we can see that the English have moved in a substantial enough force into the region. And what we might very well do is try to get at least one siege up here. In West Riding under our belt and then march down the army. Uh, cause some trouble down in that region. Uh, we're having difficulty with the second siege. The uh, the one in West Riding, they have onagers, and the other group doesn't. And also while we're here, we can actually see Ulster's continuing its war for Gwynedd against Sweden, so that's fantastic. There's been some dramatic changes in, in Sweden. The they're still fighting against the uh, the same enemy, but I'm not entirely too sure. Their flag changed, basically. Their flag changed. I think the actual queen was deposed and replaced with her husband, or something really strange. But uh, we'll take a look at that in a second. We won! Look at this! Our war in... Yay! So yeah, we weren't really involved in this. I was thinking of actually sending out the troops, getting involved, and getting up the prestige that we needed to... Uh, declare an invasion for the entire kingdom. Didn't bother. So be it. Nobody is in beat. Everyone's just... Lads, come on. You're meant to be practicing. Okay. We've taken West Riding. What would have been thought about this in former days under Flansina? That army is not large enough to take on the the English army, which is just about to actually siege down Gwent. Um, we're not making much headway in North Riding. It would probably be better if we could actually just move down the, the North Riding army. Uh, I don't think our... The, uh, the allies will travel with them. And of course, coming cross-country is going to deal chaos to our... Um, to all of our troops. 
It's been a long time since any Irish High King went to the military library, or the military part of the library. I think, was it Green Graffador? Was the last person to uh, to get this this option, and that was after a visit to Rome. We were thinking he must have picked up some books while he was there. So, down into the library. I imagine it's it's located close to the dungeon. Down into the library. Ruacon has gone. And he's found some books on Caesar. And because we're in need of it at this point in time, do you know what? A little ingenuity goes a long way in a siege. He's going to become a military engineer. And we might be able to put him in charge of a siege somewhere. As our armies march south, we've just gotten a pop-up that our sister Anya has died. It's given us 64 stress. Uh, how old was she? She was 60. So, Ruokon is living quite a long life in comparison to many of his predecessors. Definitely to any previous High Kings. It doesn't look like we're going to hit them before they finish that siege, which is a pity. I've sent down the entire army. And you know what? We'll go We'll go raiding a bit. We'll go raiding a bit. Or not raiding, but um, sieging places down once we actually get down here. Are they going to get in in time? They will. So it looks like a good thing that we sent down that second army. It would have been a close one. And in the midst of it all, as we approach Rukon's 67th birthday, which will make him the, uh, definitively, the oldest Irish High King of all time, his primary wife, I think she's been his primary wife since the very start, a daughter of Brangan, uh, she has died of old age at 67. At least the memories remain. And we're going to get 56 stress, and that's going to push him over the edge for now. And so the stress is getting to him. He's lost his wife. He's lost his sister. Uh, Robert Fisk, the journalist, passed away recently, and they had a reprinted an article of his in which he was caught speeding by members of Ungarda Shiakana. He was going to Erskine Childers' funeral, and he he told the guard that he didn't want to be late for the funeral. Uh, but the real reason is he made it look like he wanted to pay his um, his respects to, to President Childers, but uh, the real reason is because he wanted to look at Eamon de Valera. And in, in his article, he said that de Valera was, according to his... Uh, AIDS, they later released a statement that he was depressed by his great age. And possibly that's what's happening. To the High King, Rukon, he is now the, just a, a month or two, uh, two months short of hitting 67, which will make him the oldest Irish High King of all time. All of those around him are dying. He has lived an educated life, a holy life. Uh, he has seen countless people taken in the prime of their youth. Rian. I don't think Rian had even hit 30. Brangan. Wait, was Brangan killed under this ruler? Flancina was killed under this ruler. We've had countless losses under... Ruacon and under his technical predecessor, Maltholi. Yeah, I know Kieran was there in the middle, but Kieran didn't do anything. Uh, and of course, actually, I only saw it recently while I was editing one of the videos. Ruacon was, um, he was, was he steward? At 24 years of age, he was a steward to Maltholi. So this guy has served in the most tumultuous period in the Kingdom of Ireland. He was there when... The whole thing splintered apart. He watched it being reassembled. He has aided in putting it back together. He has seen countless, countless, countless people die. And he is just there constantly. Growing old. 
and thinking of all those who remain ageless in death. Is he going to turn to drink, or is he going to... And I think this is what he's going to do. He's going to start writing. He's going to lose... Because I think he'd try and, he'd try and preserve his legacy. Uh, it's going to give him a couple of... A couple of uh, negatives. Hits to everything. Then again, he is well educated, So he's going to be able to counter all of those. Maybe writing my feelings down will help me process my emotions. And we go back to our battle. Good brand rips somebody's head off. Nice. And in the midst of it all, we've gotten a lifestyle perk. Let's deal with a few things. We're dealing with the oldest Irish High King. We're dealing with the largest army that an Irish High King has ever been able to put together. Uh, we're dealing with the largest gold turnover per month that any Irish High King has ever put together. Minus 30% mercenary higher cost, like I said, when we're generating so much money and when we already have so many troops. Controlled territory defender. Causes Belli. I don't think we're going to get much further down this tree. We're talking about another 12 years or something to try and get down to um, absolute control. We've now put him in charge of one of the armies, leading a siege. He's sieging down Gwent. And approaching 67. He has commanded armies before, uh, but we're going to give him uh, some extra prowess and reduce risks from uh, commanding armies. And of course, speaking of aged military leaders, he was dead for nine years at this stage, but Brian Baru, we think was into his 70s, but he was commanding armies into his late 60s. Uh, he was present at the Battle of Clontarf, but uh, wasn't actually in command. He was on a, he was in a tent off to the, off to the side. So Ruokon is, is very much emulating some of the, some of the achievements of the real life Brian Baru. I've split the armies off, or no, they were always split. One of them has stayed behind in Gwent. That's the one under the command of the High King with no onagers. And our onagers are being sent forward to siege down the capital itself. And so, far from home, overseeing a siege. The 15th of July passes and the High King turns 67. The English are sending their forces back north, most likely to siege down West Riding. Maybe not. Maybe they're going to come in and around and try and hit the High King. They're off to the right, to the northeast. We can see uh, the French are finally getting some forces in. I was just about to complain about them. If we can hit the English a few more times, I might split the armies further and send them sieging down areas. It's going to be a lengthy and protracted campaign. It's going to be a lengthy and protracted campaign and I can't see the High King surviving. We're going to win our siege. They've started sieging right beside us. And we have just finished that siege. They've risen another a thousand troops. I won't say to be pointless to lift the siege now as it's progressing so far. We won't tempt Faith too much. We're going to switch out the High King, put Felamid Fitzpatrick back in charge, uh, send him in against this English army. We're going to take the opportunity for the High King to celebrate his birthday. I mentioned earlier on that high kings um, and things like uh, potential successors, Rian dying in battle. This was quite common for younger kings, most certainly older kings died in battle, but uh, by the time that we come to Brian Baru, again, he was seen purely as a almost a political leader at this point in time. So although he was the high king and the king of Munster, he was not put uh, commanding the armies. His son, Murcha, uh, commanded the armies, and Murica was a, an older brother of 
Donica, who was the the half brother of the guy they were fighting against. But Morica was the was the main uh, leader, and of course Morica was killed in that battle. Morica was killed in the Battle of Clontarf, along with Brian Brew and along with Morica's son. Uh, so that kind of goes to, to prove the point, but uh, Brian Brew didn't actually take command in the Battle of Clontarf, so it's perfectly in keeping with historical reality to withdraw the High King and uh, send him home to have a party. We're told that it's a cheery gathering. Welcome, friends. We've at least lifted the siege if we've done nothing else. We've hit them, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. A table has collapsed. Some people aren't too happy. We've sat with High Chiefess Sloyna, the wife of the guy who's taking all of this region. What a great night. And we've actually gone in against these forces, getting lots of pop-ups. So lots of important birthdays. We're now into November. Uh, Nyakthon has turned 16 years of age, and the first thing that we've done is we've put a hat on him and sent him out into battle. He's a champion. Nine prowess. That tells you... That tells you the problems that we're in with, uh, with champions at the moment. So, the High Chief just departs. Well, the whole thing comes to an end. We get 150 prestige and a new friend. One of our construction projects has finished. We've lost a substantial number of forces in this battle. Did they bring in some allies? I can see what they're doing. They're bringing down another 10,000, or another 1,000 th uh, troops. Um, it looks like in the very last minutes, they're actually going to turn this battle fair play to them. Fair play to them. We can either lift the siege of Gloucestershire, I think, which is going to finish in a couple of seconds. We have 13 days left. I think we'll have to leave that siege. Um, carry on. Now 5,000 French troops come down. At the very last second. They managed to turn this on its head. And we've taken Gloucestershire. We're not in a hope going to be able to march these guys in in time. What a battle! What a battle! This guy absolutely hates us. We've discovered that he owes us more money uh, than we've been currently collecting. His father, interestingly enough, is the guy who pretty much made the Kingdom of Ireland a reality. He inherited Connacht. And that allowed us to... One or two wars earlier than um, expected, attack Meath. Under the, the reign of Maltholi. Uh, he hates us, so we're not gonna we're not gonna force his hand and increase feudal taxes. We're gonna gain a weak hook on him. We we'll let slide this time. Uh, we've come in against their army here. Hopefully, we'll be able to crush them before they bring anyone else in. Now again, we have our overwhelming allies coming in to assist us. Another son has come of age, Leinshuk. They grow up so fast. Uh, he seems to have a betrothal too. I think this is actually into, uh, yeah, it is, into West Francia. Yeah. Our champion has ripped off somebody else's head. 
An alliance looks to have ended with Romagna. And there you go. The King of Romagna is dead. And as we were just discussing Italy there at the start, that's back. So he held two titles, or else they uh, they split. Uh, two of his sons now, one of them rules Italy, one of them rules Romagna. We can't form alliances with any of them. I'm not entirely too sure who was married to who. I think we had a daughter maybe married to one of his sons or something. But uh, yeah, we can't reform any of those alliances, so sadly that's gone for now. Before continuing on with the war, let's look at some of the battles we were involved in. Here is one from a year ago now at this stage, 1023, our first major engagement when we uh, brought the army down to try to lift the siege of Gwent. And there's Goodbrand up the top. One of our knights, I'm not too sure who this guy was actually serving. I think by the looks of it he was with... Um, Oh god, those allies that we bought in, whose names I've forgotten. Uh, he had his head ripped off by this guy. Or what? He didn't have his head ripped off. He was uh, he was slain in battle. Oh, he was slain in battle by this guy. And this guy had his head ripped off by a good brand. Is he one of our vassals? He is. I think I've just been calling him Ulfus because I can't pronounce his first name. So he's already coming in at the head of the list, challenging good brand. And there's Phalemede. Um, Fainly Mead Fitzpatrick, who we captured in a peasant uprising, and Cahmal of Man, so he'd be Flancina the second or third's son, who in turn is the son of Brangan, who is a son of Flancina the former High King. Then we had a second victory into early February of this year, pretty much the same people leading our kill list again. Uh, then. The defeat that we suffered not that long ago. We had no champions that might have contributed to it. 131 kills. Whoa. And they still lost some knights, even though they had they lost a lot of knights. And then where we uh, struck that army and sorted everything out. And again, we're into the same, the same old, same old. Uh, Phalemedes, after getting himself wounded, he lost an eye. And do we see? No, I was wondering if uh, if maybe if maybe our son had wandered in, and if he was now involved in these battles. There's uh, Chieftain Ernach. Again, we can see how bad we're doing with some of these uh, prowess figures, and we're not in a position to actually recruit any knights at the moment. So speaking of our, I won't say our poorly performing knights. Our knights are doing fantastic. We just don't have a lot of high quality knights. Down into our prison we go. I've managed to ransom off uh, this person for a tenner and this person for a tenner. This guy can give me 17 gold. He's making 0.5 a month and he'll give me up to a max of 100. So you're going to stay there for a while. The Duke of Holland. Uh, this guy, on the other hand, definitely not an Irish name. Giles or Giles. Uh, 12 prowess, brilliant strategist, and he's a holy warrior, so we'll get him uh, converted to insular Christianity, and we will recruit him to our court, and deploy him to, uh, to fight against England. We can't put out the call for champions, but we can put out the call for the next best thing, and that is peasant revolts. I have no idea where this one is actually going to break out. I want to say never. And those guys have made a terrible mistake by when well, they raised their forces here. They're moving north. I don't think they even know what they're doing. We do have an army of our own moving north. We're sieging Derby. I think they're just going to... Do you know what? We might as well just send them as far as Durham. Uh, I am wary of these guys basically returning to siege down the capital again. 
Ah, they're going out to see the devils. Knowing the way the AI works, they're going to go out to sea and they're just going to come straight back. They're going to go out to sea here and then they're going to land in Northumberland. They've gone off on a journey. They've gone off to a better place. I bet you they left Lancashire, marched over here. They're going to sail all around the coast and they're going to come back down. They're going to siege and Cheshire. We've reformed an alliance with Italy. Our son, Nyakthon, uh, married somebody. No, they're coming back. They're going to... That was close enough. Um, hopefully somebody will take care of them. The English are maneuvering a large enough army around in this direction. So we'd want to do something. I think we'll, we'll continue the siege here in Derby. And then... We'll bring our alliance, our forces across in, in this direction. You're going to have about 6,000 troops um, joined up shortly. Dublin is under siege. Now the English are setting sail. How very interesting. So they've abandoned that siege. Don't tell me everyone's going to Ireland. I think they were pretty much just getting around, yeah, they were just getting around that 2,900 strong army. We've sieged this area down, we have vastly superior numbers, we're going to march the entire army up, gather them here, strike the English, and I think that should bring this, uh, this conflict to an end. Here is our daughter. Being married off to the actual king of West Francia. It's not going to create an alliance. We already have one. But it'll just look fancy from our point of view. We're coming in for attack on multiple sides. Fair play to those 13 French soldiers that are trying to siege down North Riding. There's a, a substantially larger English army. Heading around the, the south here. Again, fair play to Ruokon. He's uh, gotten the wife pregnant. The English are making a run for it now that we're bringing in quite a large army. And we will leave the High King in command of one of the two armies. I think they know they're in trouble. They're trying to make a run for it. Do you know what? I think this is how the last few years of the High King's life are going to be spent. Just running around northern Scotland trying to catch up with the English army. We've hit them. And with that battle, far from English soil, we have enough of a war score to bring this war to an end and extend our holdings substantially down into northern England. We will gain 150 fame. And seize all territory. Let's enforce our demands. Greetings, High King Ruokon of Ireland. Peace be with you. And the same to you. So be it. Now we have progressed. The world looks just a bit greener than it did before. I don't know how long that war took us, but we made a substantial sum of money. I think we were on about 300 when we started. Now we're up to uh, to 500. Uh, very quickly, we'll take a look at the last battle. And again, we've the same, the same figures leading. Same figures leading. Um, do we see anybody? No. I thought we might see some of our uh, 
some of our new characters, some of the new people that we have added, that have joined as knights. Let's see now. Okay, we need to get these guys back onto Irish soil, I think. Uh, can we... what's the easiest? Swing them for... There. Get them onto Irish soil, stand them down, and get them to deal with this rebellion. Another thing is that we are substantially over our domain limit. And also somebody is raiding down, uh, east riding, near to Pockington. Pockington. So, we're probably going to hand out this entire region to members of Flansinna's family, uh, descendants of the Acre. And I'm actually going to hand out some uh, some regions up here as well, possibly, because of course we, we gave Lennox to a our sister's daughter's husband. Now that's been seized by Bran, so we're going to give Carrick to that character instead. Possibly take Lennox off of Bran and give it out as well. And if, if Bran seizes Carrick off of um, that character, I think I will just... I'll just seize the entire, all of Galloway off of Bran. He can't be trusted. Like I said, I was hoping to give this region out to members of Asta and... Astrid's family. The problem is we don't really have any viable successors there. Uh, if we were to give it out, uh, there's Krund Mole, who's the the only surviving son of either of the two of them, who is an Enail. The problem is that both of... he only has daughters. One of them is married to the king of Lotharinga. Uh, the other is a duchess in a foreign court. So if we were to give him any land, it would eventually end up leaving the kingdom. Uh, the only individual, the only other surviving descendant of any of the Acra sisters is... Uh, this guy. He is the son of... I don't think it matters who he's the son of. He is the grandson of Glad, who was married to a knight, and then, of course, Glad went and... She was a concubine of uh, Starkiller Face, and Glad is a daughter of Astrid and Flancina. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this guy some land. He's a, a courtier at the moment. And I think it is only fitting that we give him, do you know what, west and east riding. Here is our daughter Flan, who was disfigured when we were trying to cure her of smallpox. Uh, she has a number of children. The eldest is of House Vetten. We can't give her land, but we could give it to her husband. Um, he's lowborn. But Gilliforig would inherit. And he is, so this is a, a matrilineal marriage. Uh, so we'd have our son, or not our son, he's our grandson, uh, ruling at some point in time. So I think I will give this guy Lincolnshire. And he takes a fancy title for himself, Fortescue. And then for my brother, who we were supporting for the High Kingship at one stage, uh, very early on in our reign, we will grant him uh, North Riding. And I might very well actually create the Duchy and grant it to him. Now I've granted West and East Riding to uh, that guy. Can't even pronounce his name. Earl Berenger, so it's entirely possible that he'll probably revolt at some stage. He's um, he's quite powerful in that region. The the guy who previously owned Lennox, I haven't been able to... He's not in our court, and I can't get him back. I don't know what we'll do. We'll figure something out. Down into our dungeons we go again. I was going to execute Oswald, but then again... He does have learning 18, so he could end up as a bishop or something somewhere. We'll uh, negotiate his release on the condition that he joins us. Here is the Duke of Holland. He's 29 quid put together. He's no Ooh, he's making more per month now. Fantastic. We'll, uh, we'll hold on to you for another while.
Lots and lots of pop-ups. Um, I think the peasants have managed to take Dublin and they have started killing my children. I had so many hopes. My Swedish, sweetest child. Who is this now? Um, oh, this is the child. I think it was Dara. We never actually figured out how to pronounce his name. Rest in peace. So he has died in a siege. Nyakthorn has been killed during a siege. And that's brought our alliance with Italy to an end. It's given us tremendous stress. My wife has been killed during a siege. I hope you find peace. Oh, wow. That was a lot. Um, Oswald has accepted. Siege of Dublin is lost. Courtiers killed. Five courtiers were killed in total. Wow. I stood down the army. It mightn't have been the best idea. It didn't make much of a difference because uh, they pushed up past Dundelgan, so I couldn't um, I couldn't actually um, recruit them there. The army is barely even at half capacity at five and a half thousand troops. You know who's going to command this. Looks like we have discovered barracks. It's actually taking us a substantial period of time to get the army up to, uh, to capacity. Oh, that's because, yeah, because we stood them down. So maybe that wasn't a great... A great move. I don't think it made much of a difference one way or another. And with that fascination out of the way, or with that uh, that last development of barracks, it's now 10 years until we can discover public works. Uh, average development of Irish counties is up to 0 0.1, so I know it was at 0 0.08 for a while. We have been boosting the development of our counties. Um, using the scholarship of Ruokon, which is one of the reasons why he's going to be remembered as a great, or one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Irish High Kings of all time. Uh, so it's going to take 10 years to pull that off. Looks like we'll be leaving it to the next generation to progress into the feudal era. And so a totally unnecessary army... 6,200 marches across from Galloway. Probably one of the largest armies that we've ever put together. And we're going to march down into Dundelgan. I wonder if this was all a plan by that peasant leader to be noticed and to join the ranks of the High King's army, and it all went terribly, terribly wrong. In the midst of it all, uh, how old is the High King now? Uh, 68, just short of his 69th birthday in July. A daughter of luck. May you grow to be strong and wise, my daughter. We think about what happened to... Uh, two of our children already. You can see we're also down a number of wives now. Oh, I forgot we've actually uh, we've assigned a brand new primary wife. Mm, diplomacy isn't great. But basically <clears throat> that that guy will stand down our army are we going to be hit by? It'll, be, it'll take four months. Basically that guy thought this is this will get me into the army this will get me into the the kingdom and it just went it just went terribly wrong it just went terribly wrong people died they weren't supposed to there'll be no joining the armies for you 
The lists from that battle, of course, aren't all that interesting because there wasn't all that many knights. We have the usual three at the top. Uh, the Thalamede dropped below this guy, I think maybe on alphabetical order or something. Uh, here's Giles in his first battle. This probably would have been Nyakthon's first battle as well, had he not been killed in that siege. In an office where surviving your 50s is unusual, High King Ruakon stands on the cusp of entering his 70s. We're going to stop the game on the 15th of July, or stop today's episode. On the 15th of July, 1025, his 69th birthday, and take a look at the world around him. As he's shoving up in years, I was going to see if um, if it'd be wiser to change the succession away from Ale Gaul, if there was maybe somebody younger. Uh, he's still only 22, so that's not too bad. But the majority, the overwhelming majority of the kingdom has come in behind him in lockstep. Why, why are they all supporting him so much? Um, generous likes forgiving. Uh, I trust the judgment of a ruler I like. Plus 100. I cannot risk angering the dreaded High King Ruokon. Plus 70. So he's got two virtues and the fear and terror that people feel for the High Kingship uh, is, um, is forcing them, or not forcing them, but they're, uh, they're basically too afraid to go against the High King, including... Luead, who is trying to conquer, uh, basically, substantial chunks of Wales, and Ernoch, who would have been a, um, a previous potential successor. 42 now. Uh, he's not, he's not afeard of us. Um, here we have somebody who's on a zero. So, he's too young, so one or two, one or two more years is probably going to change that. Uh, so... It looks like this is indeed, unless he dies in battle, our next High King. I didn't expect that Ruokon was going to see out this episode. Um, so let's let's see what the world around him looks like, or what what Ruokon is going to be facing in the next episode, or what um, El Gol will be facing in the next episode should he ascend to the High Kingship. We didn't expect the High King to make it to the end of this episode. Here's something else we didn't expect to make it to the end of this episode. This war for Sweden. It's now turning dramatically against the Swedish. They're down 78% in war score. But we can see that there's been kind of a change in war leader. Not necessarily war leader, but um, the, uh, the area that they control. It looks like this woman, the former queen of the Sami, has been deposed by her husband... And it's no longer a war for the complete unification of the Sami and, and Sweden. Uh, instead, it's just the couple of areas that she controls. Uh, she's down now to being able to put together 16,000 troops. But we are going to see, probably soon enough, the amalgamation of these areas. While they are weak, would it be worth our while to attack for these two counties in Lothian. Our problem is that we'd attack, we'd siege down these two counties, these are already being sieged down, what would we do then to build up war score? Would we need to deploy our troops and bring them across into Sweden and, and possibly end up attacking this, uh, this overwhelming army? Something to think about on the next episode, but it looks like we're going to see major upheavals soon enough. It wasn't the full conquest of England that we had hoped. His tremendous age is depressing the High King. He has suffered a tremendous loss throughout the decades that he has ruled, and even just in a single siege, lost two sons and a wife. Will he be able to hold it together and see out the next episode, and at least make it into his 70s? We're now 25 years beyond the original goal that I set for the end of the series. I think it's highly likely that we'll be making it into the 1060s. I do try, I do want to try and get that 
empire. I do want to try to get that empire, but it's very expensive, and we do have a good bit more work to do. So thank you for joining me on this episode, and I hope that you will join me on the next one as we start with a hunt to celebrate the 69th birthday of the oldest High King in Irish history.